Chapter 20 of Humorous Ghost Stories This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Humorous Ghost Stories, selected by Dorothy Scarborough. Chapter 20 The Spectre of Tappington, Part 1 from the Ingoldsby Legends, compiled by Richard Barham. It is very odd, though. What can have become of them, said Charles Seaforth, as he peeped under the valence of an old-fashioned bedstead, in an old-fashioned apartment of a still more old-fashioned manor-house. Tis confoundedly odd, and I can't make it out at all. Why, Barney, where are they? and where the dell are you no answer was returned to this appeal and the lieutenant who was in the main a reasonable person at least as reasonable a person as any young gentleman of twenty-two in the service can fairly be expected to be cooled when he reflected that his servant could scarcely reply extempore to a summons which it was impossible he should hear an application to the bell was the considerate result and the footsteps of as tight a lad as ever put pipe-clay to belt sounded along the gallery come in said his master an ineffectual attempt upon the door reminded mr seaforth that he had locked himself in by heaven this is the oddest thing of all said he as he turned the key and admitted mr maguire into his dormitory barney where are my pantaloons is it the breeches asked the valet casting an inquiring eye round the apartment is it the breeches sir yes what have you done with them sure then your honour had them on when you went to bed and it's hereabouts they'll be i'll be bail and barney lifted a fashionable tunic from a cane-backed armchair proceeding in his examination but the search was in vain there was the tunic aforesaid there was a smart-looking kerseymere waistcoat but the most important article of all in a gentleman's wardrobe was still wanting where can they be asked the master with a strong accent on the auxiliary verb sorrow a no i knows said the man it must have been the devil then after all who has been here and carried them off cried seaforth staring full into barney's face mr maguire was not devoid of the superstition of his countrymen still he looked as if he did not quite subscribe to the sequitur his master read incredulity in his countenance why i tell you barney i put them there on that armchair when i got into bed and by heaven i distinctly saw the ghost of the old fellow they told me of come in at midnight put on my pantaloons and walk away with them maybe so was the cautious reply i thought of course it was a dream but then where the dell are the breeches the question was more easily asked than answered barney renewed his search while the lieutenant folded his arms and leaning against the toilet sunk into a reverie after all it must be some trick of my laughter-loving cousins said seaforth ah then the ladies chimed in mr maguire though the observation was not addressed to him and it will be miss caroline or miss fanny that stole your honour's things i hardly know what to think of it pursued the bereaved lieutenant still speaking in soliloquy with his eye resting dubiously on the chamber door i locked myself in that's certain and but there must be some other entrance to the room pooh i remember the private staircase how could i be such a fool and he crossed the chamber to where a low oaken doorcase was dimly visible in a distant corner he paused before it 
nothing now interfered to screen it from observation but it bore tokens of having been at some earlier period concealed by tapestry remains of which yet clothed the walls on either side the portal this way they must have come said seaforth i wish with all my heart i had caught them ah oh, the kittens sighed mr barry Maguire. but the mystery was yet as far from being solved as before true there was the other door but then that too on examination was even more firmly secured than the one which opened on the gallery two heavy bolts on the inside effectually prevented any coup de main on the lieutenant's bivouac from that quarter he was more puzzled than ever nor did the minutest inspection of the walls and floor throw any light upon the subject one thing only was clear the breeches were gone it is very singular said the lieutenant tappington generally called tapton everard is an antiquated but commodious manor house in the eastern division of the county of kent a former proprietor had been high sheriff in the days of elizabeth and many a dark and a dismal tradition was yet extant of the licentiousness of his life and the enormity of his offences the glen which the keeper's daughter was seen to enter but never known to quit still frowns darkly as of yore while an ineradicable bloodstain on the oaken stair yet bids defiance to the united energies of soap and sand but it is with one particular apartment that a deed of more especial atrocity is said to be connected a strange guest so runs the legend arrived unexpectedly at the mansion of the bad sir giles they met in apparent friendship but the ill-concealed scowl on their master's brow told the domestics that the visit was not a welcome one the banquet however was not spared the wine-cup circulated freely too freely perhaps for sounds of discord at length reached the ears of even the excluded serving-men as they were doing their best to imitate their betters in the lower hall alarmed some of them ventured to approach the parlour one an old and favoured retainer of the house went so far as to break in upon his master's privacy sir giles already high in oath fiercely enjoined his absence and he retired not however before he had distinctly heard from the stranger's lips a menace that there was that within his pocket which could disprove the knight's right to issue that or any other command within the walls of tapton the intrusion though momentary seemed to have produced a beneficial effect the voices of the disputants fell and the conversation was carried on thenceforth in a more subdued tone till as evening closed in the domestics when summoned to attend with lights found not only cordiality restored but that a still deeper carouse was meditated fresh stoops and from the choicest bins were produced nor was it till at a late or rather early hour that the revellers sought their chambers the one allotted to the stranger occupied the first floor of the eastern angle of the building and had once been the favourite apartment of sir giles himself scandal ascribed this preference to the facility which a private staircase communicating with the grounds had afforded him in the old knight's time of following his wicked courses unchecked by parental observation a consideration which ceased to be of weight when the death of his father left him uncontrolled master of his estate and actions from that period sir giles had established himself in what were called the state apartments and the oaken chamber was rarely tenanted save on occasions of extraordinary festivity or when the yule log drew an unusually large ascension of guests around the christmas hearth on this eventful night it was prepared for the unknown visitor who sought his couch heated and inflamed from his midnight orgies and in the morning was found in his bed a swollen and blackened corpse no marks of violence appeared upon the body 
but the livid hue of the lips, and certain dark-colored spots visible on the skin, aroused suspicions which those who entertained them were too timid to express. Apoplexy, induced by the excesses of the preceding night, Sir Giles's confidential leech pronounced to be the cause of his sudden dissolution. The body was buried in peace, and though some shook their heads as they witnessed the haste with which the funeral rites were hurried on, none ventured to murmur. Other events arose to distract the attention of the retainers. Men's minds became occupied by the stirring politics of the day, while the near approach of that formidable armada, so vainly arrogating itself a title which the very elements joined with human valor to disprove, soon interfered to weaken if not obliterate all remembrance of the nameless stranger who had died within the walls of tapton everard years rolled on the bad sir giles had himself long since gone to his account the last as it was believed of his immediate line though a few of the older tenants were sometimes heard to speak of an elder brother who had disappeared early in life and never inherited the estate. Rumors, too, of his having left a son in foreign lands, were at one time rife, but they died away, nothing occurring to support them. The property passed unchallenged to a collateral branch of the family, and the secret, if secret there were, was buried in Denton churchyard, in the lonely grave of the mysterious stranger. One circumstance alone occurred, after a long intervening period, to revive the memory of these transactions. Some workmen employed in grubbing an old plantation, for the purpose of raising on its site a modern shrubbery, dug up, in the execution of their task, the mildewed remnants of what seemed to have been once a garment. On more minute inspection, enough remained of silken slashes and a coarse embroidery to identify the relics as having once formed part of a pair of trunk hose, while a few papers which fell from them, altogether illegible from damp and age, were by the unlearned rustics conveyed to the then owner of the estate. Whether the squire was more successful in deciphering them was never known, he certainly never alluded to their contents and little would have been thought of the matter but for the inconvenient memory of one old woman who declared she heard her grandfather say that when the strange guest was poisoned though all the rest of his clothes were there his breeches the supposed repository of the supposed documents could never be found the master of tapton everard smiled when he heard dame jones's hint of deeds which might impeach the validity of his own title in favour of some unknown descendant of some unknown heir and the story was rarely alluded to save by one or two miracle mongers who had heard that others had seen the ghost of old sir giles in his nightcap issue from the postern enter the adjoining copse and wring his shadowy hands in agony as he seemed to search vainly for something hidden among the evergreens. The stranger's death-room had, of course, been occasionally haunted from the time of his decease, but the periods of visitation had latterly become very rare, even Mrs. Butherby, the housekeeper, being forced to admit that, during her long sojourn at the manor, she had never met with anything worse than herself though as the old lady afterwards added upon more mature reflection i must say i think i saw the devil once such was the legend attached to tapton everard and such the story which the lively caroline ingoldsby detailed to her equally mercurial cousin charles seaforth lieutenant in the honourable east india company's second regiment of bombay fencibles as arm in arm they promenaded a gallery decked with some dozen grim-looking ancestral portraits and among others with that of the redoubted sir giles himself the gallant commander had that very morning paid his first visit to the house of his maternal uncle after an absence of several years passed with his regiment on the arid plains of hindostan whence he was now returned on a three years furlough he had gone out a boy. 
he returned a man but the impression made upon his youthful fancy by his favorite cousin remained unimpaired and to tapton he directed his steps even before he sought the home of his widowed mother comforting himself in this breach of filial decorum by the reflection that as the manor was so little out of his way it would be unkind to pass as it were the door of his relatives without just looking in for a few hours but he found his uncle as hospitable and his cousin more charming than ever and the looks of one and the requests of the other soon precluded the possibility of refusing to lengthen the few hours into a few days though the house was at the moment full of visitors the peterses were from ramsgate and mr mrs and two miss simpkinsons from bath had come to pass a month with the family and tom ingoldsby had brought down his college friend the hon augustus suckle thumbkin with his groom and pointers to take a fortnight's shooting and then there was mrs ogleton the rich young widow with her large black eyes who people did say was setting her cap at the young squire though mrs botherby did not believe it and above all there was mademoiselle pauline her femme de chambre who mundued everything and everybody and cried quelle horreur at mrs botherby's cap in short to use the last named and much respected lady's own expression the house was choke full to the very attics all save the oaken chamber which as the lieutenant expressed a most magnanimous disregard of ghosts was forthwith appropriated to his particular accommodation mr maguire meanwhile was fain to share the apartment of oliver dobbs the squire's own man a jocular proposal of joint occupancy having been first indignantly rejected by mademoiselle though preferred with the last taste and life of mr barney's most insinuating brogue come charles the urn is absolutely getting cold your breakfast will be quite spoiled what can have made you so idle such was the morning salutation of miss ingoldsby to the militaire as he entered the breakfast-room half an hour after the latest of the party a pretty gentleman truly to make an appointment with chimed in miss frances what has become of our ramble to the rocks before breakfast oh the young men never think of keeping a promise now said mrs peters a little ferret-faced woman with underdone eyes when i was a young man said mr peters i remember i always made a point of pray how long ago was that asked mr simpkinson from bath why sir when i married mrs peters i was let me see i was do pray hold your tongue p and eat your breakfast interrupted his better half who had a mortal horror of chronological references it's very rude to tease people with your family affairs the lieutenant had by this time taken his seat in silence a good-humoured nod and a glance half smiling half inquisitive being the extent of his salutation smitten as he was and in the immediate presence of her who had made so large a hole in his heart his manner was evidently distrait which the fair caroline in her secret soul attributed to his being solely occupied by her angrement how would she have bridled had she known that they only shared his meditations with a pair of breeches charles drank his coffee and spiked some half-dozen eggs darting occasionally a penetrating glance at the ladies in hope of detecting the supposed waggery by the evidence of some furtive smile or conscious look but in vain not a dimple moved indicative of roguery nor did the slightest elevation of eyebrow rise confirmative of his suspicions hints and insinuations passed unheeded more particular inquiries were out of the question the subject was unapproachable in the meantime patent cords were just the thing for a morning's ride and 
breakfast ended away cantered the party over the downs till every faculty absorbed by the beauties animate and inanimate which surrounded him lieutenant seaforth of the bombay fencibles bestowed no more thought upon his breeches than if he had been born on the top of ben lomond another night passed away the sun rose brilliantly forming with his level beams a splendid rainbow in the far-off west whither the heavy cloud which for the last two hours had been pouring its waters on the earth was now flying before him ah then and it's little good it'll be the clanning of ye apostrophized mr barry maguire as he deposited in front of his master's toilet a pair of brand new jockey boots one of hobie's primest fits which the lieutenant had purchased on his way through town on that very morning they had come for the first time under the valet's depurating hand so little soiled indeed from the turfy ride of the preceding day that a less scrupulous domestic might perhaps have considered the application of warren's matchless or oxalic acid altogether superfluous not so barney with the nicest care had he removed the slightest impurity from each polished surface and there they stood rejoicing in their sable radiance no wonder a pang shot across mr maguire's breast as he thought on the work now cut out for them so different from the light labours of the day before no wonder he murmured with a sigh as the scarce dried window panes disclosed a road now inch deep in mud ah then it's little good clannin of ye for well had he learned in the hall below that eight miles of a stiff clay soil lay between the manor and bolsover abbey whose picturesque ruins like ancient rome majestic in decay the party had determined to explore the master had already commenced dressing and the man was fitting straps upon a light pair of crane-necked spurs when his hand was arrested by the old question barney where are the breeches they were nowhere to be found mr seaforth descended that morning whip in hand and equipped in a handsome green riding frock but no breeches and boots to match were there loose jean trousers surmounting a pair of diminutive wellingtons embraced somewhat incongruously his nether man vice the patent cords returned like yesterday's pantaloons absent without leave the top boots had a holiday a fine morning after the rain said to mr simpkinson from bath just the thing for the ops said mr peters i remember when i was a boy do hold your tongue p said mrs peters advice which that exemplary matron was in the constant habit of administering to her p as she called him whenever he prepared to vent his reminiscences her precise reason for this it would be difficult to determine unless indeed the story be true which a little bird had whispered into mrs botherby's ear mr peters though now a wealthy man had received a liberal education at a charity school and was apt to recur to the days of his muffin cap and leathers as usual he took his wife's hint in good part and paused in his reply a glorious day for the ruins said young ingoldsby but charles what the deuce are you about you don't mean to ride through our lanes in such toggery as that lassie me said miss julia simpkinson won't you be very wet you had better take tom's cab quoth the squire but this proposition was at once overruled mrs ogleton had already nailed the cab a vehicle of all others the best adapted for a snug flirtation or drive miss julia in the phaeton no that was the post of mr peters who indifferent as an equestrian had acquired some fame as a whip while travelling through the midland counties for the firm of bagshaw snivelby and grimes thank you 
I shall ride with my cousins, said Charles, with as much nonchalance as he could assume, and he did so. Mr. Ingoldsby, Mrs. Peters, Mr. Simpkinson from Bath, and his eldest daughter with her album, followed in the family coach. The gentleman commoner voted the affair done slow, and declined the party altogether in favor of the gamekeeper and a cigar. There was no fun in looking at old houses. Mrs. Simpkinson preferred a short sojour in the still room with Mrs. Botherby, who had promised to initiate her in the grand arcanum, the transmutation of gooseberry jam into guava jelly. Did you ever see an old abbey before, Mrs. Peters? Yes, miss, a French one. We have got one at Ramsgate. He teaches the Miss Joneses to parlez-vous and is turned of sixty. Miss Simpkinson closed her album with an air of ineffable disdain. Mr. Simpkinson from Bath was a professed antiquary, and one of the first water. He was master of Gwillem's heraldry, and Mill's history of the Crusades, knew every plate in the monasticon, had written an essay on the origin and dignity of the office of overseer, and settled the date on a Queen Anne's farthing. An influential member of the Antiquarian Society, to whose beauties of Bagnigga Wells he had been a liberal subscriber, procured him a seat at the board of that learned body, since which happy epoch Sylvanus Urban had not a more indefatigable correspondent. His inaugural essay on the President's cocked hat was considered a miracle of erudition, and his account of the earliest application of gilding to gingerbread, a masterpiece of antiquarian research. His eldest daughter was of a kindred spirit. If her father's mantle had not fallen upon her, it was only because he had not thrown it off himself. She had caught hold of its tail, however, while it yet hung upon his honored shoulders. To souls so congenial, what a sight was the magnificent ruin of Bolsover, its broken arches, its moldering pinnacles, and the airy tracery of its half-demolished windows. The party were in raptures. Mr. Simpkinson began to meditate an essay, and his daughter an ode. Even Seaforth, as he gazed on these lonely relics of the olden time, was betrayed into a momentary forgetfulness of his love and losses. The widow's eyeglass turned from her Sisabo's whiskers to the mantling ivy. Mrs. Peters wiped her spectacles and her p supposed the central tower had once been the county jail the squire was a philosopher and had been there often before so he ordered out the cold tongue and chickens bolsover priory said mr simpkinson with the air of a connoisseur bolsover priory was founded in the reign of henry the sixth about the beginning of the eleventh century hugh de bolsover had accompanied that monarch to the holy land in the expedition undertaken by way of penance for the murder of his young nephews in the tower upon the dissolution of the monasteries the veteran was enfeifed in the lands and manor to which he gave his own name of bolsover or b owls over by corruption bolsover a bee in chief over three owls all proper being the armorial ensigns borne by this distinguished crusader at the siege of Acre. Ah, that was Sir Sidney Smith, said Mr. Peters. I've heard tell of him, and all about Mrs. Partington, and... P, be quiet, and don't expose yourself, sharply interrupted his lady. P was silenced, and betook himself to the bottled stout. These lands, continued the antiquary were held in grand sergeantry by the presentation of three white owls and a pot of honey lassie me how nice said miss julia mr peters licked his lips pray give me leave my dear owls and honey whenever the king should come a rat-catching into this part of the country 
Rat-catching, ejaculated the squire, pausing abruptly in the mastication of a drumstick. To be sure, my dear sir, don't you remember the rats came under the forest laws? A minor species of venison? Rats and mice, and such small deer, eh? Shakespeare, you know. Our ancestors ate rats. The nasty fellows, shuddered Miss Julia, in a parenthesis. And owls, you know, are capital mousers. I've seen a howl, said Mr. Peters. There is one in the Sohological Gardens. A little hook-nosed chap in a wig. Only its feathers and... Poor P. was never destined to finish a speech. Do be quiet, cried the authoritative voice. And the would-be naturalist shrank into his shell, like a snail in the Sohological Gardens. You should read Blunt's jocular tenures, Mr. Ingoldsby, pursued Simpkinson. What a learned man was Blunt! Why, sir, his royal highness the Duke of York once paid a silver horseshoe to Lord Ferrars. I've heard of him, broke in the incorrigible Peters. He was hanged at the Old Bailey in a silk rope for shooting Dr. Johnson. The antiquary vouchsafed no notice of the interruption, but, taking a pinch of snuff, he continued his harangue. A silver horseshoe, sir, which is due from every scion of royalty who rides across one of his manors. And if you look into the Penny County Histories, now publishing by an eminent friend of mine, you will find that Langle in County Norfolk was held by one Baldwin per saltum, sufflatum, et petum. That is, he has to come every Christmas into Westminster Hall, there to take a leap, cry hem, and... Mr. Simpkinson, a glass of sherry, cried Tom Ingoldsby, hastily. Not any, thank you, sir. This Baldwin, surnamed Le... Mrs. Ogleton challenges you, sir. She insists upon it, said Tom still more rapidly, at the same time filling a glass, and forcing it on the scavant, who, thus arrested in the very crisis of his narrative, received and swallowed the potation as if it were a physic. "'What on earth has Miss Simpkinson discovered there?' continued Tom. "'Something of interest. See how fast she is writing?' The diversion was effectual. Everyone looked towards Miss Simpkinson, who, far too ethereal for creature comforts, was seated apart on the dilapidated remains of an altar tomb, committing eagerly to paper something that had strongly impressed her. The air, the eye in a fine frenzy rolling, all betokened that the divine Aflorus was come. Her father rose, and stole silently towards her. What an old bore, muttered young Ingoldsby, alluding, perhaps, to a slice of brawn which he had just begun to operate upon, but which, from the celerity with which it disappeared, did not seem so very difficult of mastication. But what had become of Seaforth and his fair Caroline all this while? Why, it so happened that they had been simultaneously stricken with the picturesque appearance of one of those high and pointed arches, which the eminent antiquary, Mr. Horsley Curtis, had described in his ancient records as a gothic window of the saxon order and then the ivy clustered so thickly and so beautifully on the other side that they went round to look at that and then their proximity deprived it of half its effect and so they walked across to a little knoll a hundred yards off and in crossing a small ravine they came to what in ireland they call a bad step and charles had to carry his cousin over it and then when they had to come back, she would not give him the trouble again for the world, so they followed a better but more circuitous route, and there were hedges and ditches in the way, and stiles to get over and gates to get through, so that an hour or more had elapsed before they were able to rejoin the party. Lassie me, said Miss Julia Simpkinson, 
how long have you been gone and so they had the remark was a very just as well as a very natural one they were gone a long while and a nice cosy chat they had and what do you think it was all about my dear miss oh lassie me love no doubt and the moon and eyes and nightingales and stay stay my sweet young lady do not let the fervour of your feelings run away with you i do not pretend to say indeed that one or more of these pretty subjects might not have been introduced but the most important and leading topic of the conference was lieutenant seaforth's breeches caroline said charles i have had some very odd dreams since i have been at tappington dreams have you smiled the young lady arching her taper neck like a swan in pluming dreams have you ah dreams or dream perhaps i should say for though repeated it was still the same and what do you imagine was its subject it is impossible for me to divine said the tongue i have not the least difficulty in guessing said the eye as plainly as ever i spoke i dreamt of your great-grandfather there was a change in the glance my great-grandfather yes the old sir giles or sir john you told me about the other day he walked into my bedroom in his short cloak of murray-coloured velvet his long rapier and his raleigh-looking hat and feather just as the picture represents him but with one exception and what was that why his lower extremities which were visible were those of a skeleton well well after taking a turn or two about the room and looking round him with a wistful air he came to the bed's foot stared at me in a manner impossible to describe and then he he laid hold of my pantaloons whipped his long bony legs into them in a twinkling and strutting up to the glass seemed to view himself in it with great complacency i tried to speak but in vain the effort however seemed to excite his attention for wheeling about he showed me the grimmest looking death's head you can well imagine and with an indescribable grin strutted out of the room absurd charles how can you talk such nonsense but caroline the breeches are really gone End of section twenty